Welcome Home with Barbara Beck, a Good Life 45 original production. Get ready to watch hope happen. Hey everyone, I'm Barbara Beck. I'd like to thank you for tuning in to Welcome Home. Today we're going to be talking about the church and what, if anything, is wrong with her. And when I say the church, I'm actually talking about the body of Christ, all of us as Christians. What are we doing wrong? What are we doing right? and what needs to happen to make sure the church continues to thrive and grow. Also, it might be interesting to talk about church trends, how the church has changed in the last hundred years, and what we're doing, if anything, to help our young people find church appealing and necessary. You're going to love our program today, as I had the unique opportunity to visit and talk with a very informed panel of godly men at Calvario City Church, led by Dr. Nino Gonzalez, Dr. Dr. Gabriel Salguero and Dr. Richard Stearns about the future of the church, where it's headed. You'll be super interested to hear what they have to say about this topic. But first, let's hear from our wonderful current ladies and hear what they have to say about what's wrong and what's right with the church. Welcome, ladies. Hi. 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 So glad to have everybody Thank here you. today. To here. Yeah. So is anything wrong with the church? Is, is, or is it all right with the church? <laughs> I think this is an amazing topic, a topic for right now yes. what is happening in our country. Um, what's wrong, what's right with the church, if there's anything wrong, if there's anything right, because we have to understand that when we're talking about the church, we're talking about the body of Christ. Right. We're talking about humans. Yes. And we're the people that make up the church. So we're going to have to look at our, it's like an inward perspective. Yes. As opposed to looking at the church body. We have to look yes. inward to ourselves first. And that's why I think that needs to start. What are we doing to make the church better? Or what are we doing that is making the church look like it is going in a different direction that God wanted it to be? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What do you think, church person over here? You're the <laughs> wife of a wonderful pastor as well, you and Deborah, yes. representing the church. Well, the church, obviously, <laughs> the, body, the body of Christ. Yes. Um, the church is wonderful. Yes. The, the, the bride of Christ is right. wonderful. Um, we are imperfect wherever humans enter into anything. Um, yeah. With our fallen nature, we tend to mess things up. Um, we don't hit the mark as we should. Um, but yes, we are the body of Christ. We are empowered. We are the head. We're not the tail. So in terms of representing um, God, our Lord and Savior, yes, we're here and we're here to stay. Mm -hmm. The church mm -hmm. will overcome. That's right. And the gates of hell will not defeat Amen. the church. Amen. At the same time, yes, there are certain elements of the church that I personally feel need to change. And as I studied and I prayed, I, I wrote mm -hmm. a few things, but I just want to mention one mm -hmm. that has struck a chord most recently, and that's who are who is our allegiance to? Um, because of the most recent uh, presidential elections, um, I just feel that the church has been kind of divided, um, where our allegiance is not to our Lord and Savior. Our allegiance is either to uh, the Republican Party or the Democrat Party. And I think we have to come back to our roots and say, no, mm -hmm. our allegiance is to Christ. We are not Republicans or, or, or Democrats, or we are Christians. And it has saddened me that the world has, has seen um, that division mm -hmm. amongst the church. And then obviously the news has it in you know, the front pages of everything. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to go back, mm -hmm. Barbara, to our roots and I agree. our allegiance is to Christ. Absolutely. Right. That's right. I think it's important that we touch on that for a second because um, I think like we all have opinions. We all have opinions on things. There's we have opinions on current events. We have opinions on all of these things and and you know, I have to be very careful to not voice my opinion on social media or voice my, you know, 
um, opinion on one of these smaller issues that might be important to me, but guess what's the most important to me? Right. The kingdom of God. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of God is the most important. Grow in the kingdom, making sure people are saved and going to heaven someday. That's the most important thing to me. So if I have an opinion on whether, you know, um, whether people should be Republican or Democratic or whether, you know, you should immunize babies or not immunize babies. I mean, if I have those opinions, which I do, I think everybody's got an opinion. And I always say they're like armpits. Sometimes they stink, okay? <laughs> and that's the whole thing. But you, the, the truth is we have to, the body of Christ has to recognize that um, if we start voicing our opinion on all of these smaller issues and we get the big O word offense going, when someone's offended by something, and, and the enemy loves offense. He yes. loves to use offense to get keep people from the kingdom. If they are offended by, some, by my issue on something else, then when I go to speak to them about the kingdom of God, and I go to speak to them about Jesus, they're more apt to be turned off from that message hmm. than if I keep my opinion to myself. Yes, I'm a voting person. I know what I vote. I know what my family stands for, but that's not what my call is on my life. The call on my life is to... Um, go out and preach the gospel and, and help people renew their minds in the word of God. And, and I don't want to interfere with that call because then I have to answer to God on that. When I mm. think about that, I think about um, Jesus. When he went into the church and he overthrew the money changers and things were not going the way they're supposed to, people were out of order. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that Christians have a right to speak against things that are not according to the word of God. Right. Right. It has to be built on the word. The foundation yes. of God, it will not fall, it will not change because my opinions don't fall in line with what I think should be happening. Yes. It has to be round, grounded and rooted on the word of God when you speak out. I don't think we should look away from things that are, are truly that Jesus even spoke about, like the homeless and the, the, yes. the disenfranchised. There's okay. things that we as Christians, we are supposed to engage in, but there's a way. And I believe that when you pray to God, God will give you an open door. You don't have to kick a door open when God wants you to walk through it. Yes. He'll open a door for you mm -hmm. and he'll give you, he'll give you words to say. He said, I'll, if you pray to me, I'll, t I'll tell you what to say. I'll tell you who to say it to, where to say it, and I'll give you a platform to say it. So you have to make sure that you're doing things not because of what you feel or what you think, but what does the word say what about word that? Say? Word has to back you up and it will right. back you up every time whether people like it or not. Right. And we are going to have to stand up for biblical issues. Right. We are going to have Absolutely. to stand up for the right. word of God, but the word to says God to do it with kindness mm -hmm. and gentleness and respect. Right. And that was that's important. That's like, you know, if we go out there and we're yelling the bullhorn out there mm -hmm. and just saying, you know, you're going to hell if you don't receive Christ. I mean, right. that is not pulling people to the gospel. Right. That is not drawing people to Jesus. Love pulls people right. to Jesus. And even with that, that's true. You're going to go to hell, but that's yes. not the way, the, <laughs> the proper, proper way. way. If you don't yes. receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are going to go to hell. Yes. But that's not the way to do it. Gentleness and that's what I'm saying. When God opens a door for you and you pray and you seek Him, He's going to give you the way to, to open up and be able to exchange what He's put in your spirit. Amen. And that's what you have to wait on. He tells you what to do. Sometimes He doesn't tell you when, where, and with whom. So you have to wait on those things. I think that the church needs to, and I love everything that you ladies are saying, but I think the church needs to also be really aware if they are going to be, we, the church, right. if we're going to be relevant, if we're going to be reaching millennials, yes. then we have to be addressing, we have to be real for first, first of all, yes. we have to be real yes. and we have to be addressing social issues. Yes. Now we do it in a biblical way and we yes. do it in a kind and respectful way, but where the church has failed in the past is when they don't bring up some of these things. I want to know what my preacher thinks about gay marriage. I want to know what my preacher mm -hmm. thinks about all of these different social issues, of, about people who are marginalized, about, you know, racism, about all kinds of things that no, it's not comfortable to talk about it. Nobody wants to talk about it. I just want to get up there and sometimes just hear him read the Bible and just read the Bible. But really, that's right. not going to attract new millennials that are coming up and, and the young people that want to hear about things that are relevant to them, how they can grow, how they can be a part of the church. And, and we've got to learn how to agree and disagree okay. in a kind, loving way. Yeah. Um, I wrote down that one of the positives of the church is its charitable, charitable works. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. We are great yes. with, with charity, yes. but charity is also deficient. And I, I explain the advocacy and the justice, the biblical justice mm -hmm. works such as this. 
if someone pushes a human being off of a cliff mm -hmm. and the person lands in the valley, the church is very good at running to the person, cleaning them up, putting band-aids, mm -hmm. uh, clothing them, and feeding the person. But where, for me, the church has lacked is asking, who pushed him off the cliff? Mm. Mm. That's where the advocacy and yes. to me, the biblical justice comes, mm. where we cannot turn a blind eye. Um, yes, we do it in love and not in a divisive fashion, but we have to ask the questions, Barbara. I agree, mm. I agree. I agree too. What are some trends that the church is facing? I know we um, had done a really good with your pastor was on that, that mm -hmm. um, Jason Height as, as and well. And your husband was on that. I and Marvin Jackson yes. was on that panel <laughs> yes. as well. We talked about cultural trends, right. where the church is headed. The church will never die because right. Jesus is the head of the church, right? Yes. So it's, the church is going to thrive and survive. But what are some of the trends of the, of the church? What, is, what does the future look like for the church? I'm thinking biblical illiteracy. I think we really need to mm. trust that. Mm -hmm. um, we've watered it down. We, we've, we've watered it down. Um, talking about millennials, mm. uh, if, if we took a survey of several millennials, not from our church, but just in, within the community um, that profess to be Christians, mm -hmm. can you uh, say five verses from memory? Mm. Mm. Just five. Wow. wow. Mm -hmm. wow. <clears throat> and very few could. Yeah. We went down. Can you say four? <laughs> Can you say three? Can you say two? And the majority could say two. Wow. So biblical illiteracy yeah. is something that I think we need to address. Right. It's yeah. a cultural trend. It I is think, a trend. It is. Um, that we need to. Yeah, I will tell you that my, my 27 year old daughter just the other day, they're going to a wonderful church. It has a denomination. I won't tell you what the denomination is, but it's not Baptist. And my daughter <laughs> was brought up Baptist. And let right. me tell you, she said, here's what I miss about the Baptist church. We're not learning scripture. We're not memorizing. We're not learning the old hymns. I mean, part of her deal was having to go to choir, and they learned a hymn every month, you know, an old-fashioned hymn. Whether that's relevant now or not, she loves the fact, as a 27-year-old millennial, she loves the fact that the Baptist church taught her the Word of God, because many of the hymns that you learn, too, mm -hmm. are straight out of the Bible, yes, word yes, for word. Yes, right. So, yeah, that is a trend. Biblical, I never had heard it said exactly that way, Jeanette, but it's so true. Literacy is, you know, in a lot of churches, we're not teaching them mm -hmm. to memorize God's Word and hide it in their hearts. Mm -hmm. See, church is not like our old church when I was growing up. Right. You went to church, you, they sang hymns that you hardly did. You brought your Bible, but you didn't really open your Bible. <laughs> but the millennials are totally different. They want to know why. Why is God good? Right. How is God good? Right. Yes. They want to hear your testimonies. I mean, you can't preach to them. You have to teach them. They want to learn about your God. They want to learn what it is that makes you keep going back every day and every Sunday and, and keep praising Him. What is it? Mm -hmm. And we can't treat them like we were little children mm -hmm. and they just said, because I said so. Mm -hmm. you, have to go, you have to go line upon line, precept upon precept yeah. to make sure that they understand. Because see, they want to understand the yes. Word. Yes. Because see, if you can understand the Word and mm -hmm. you get that revelation, you can apply that Word to your life and they can actually see their life changed. They want you to tell them, what did you do mm -hmm. that made your life change? What part of that word worked for you? And if you tell them if all of it works, if you apply it, and if you really do it, the word works. Yes, the word works. And yes. they're word looking works. for yes. that. They're looking for people that actually are walking, doing the word. Well, and they see us as disingenuous. People that are, the millennials would look at me, someone my age, and say, you're real the way you were brought right. You didn't tell us what was, you told us what was right and wrong. You told us about the word, but right. you didn't really, you weren't really living it. Or you didn't really, um, you didn't really let me know that, that everything did, wasn't perfect. Just because I have my hair and makeup and a nice dress on doesn't mean that I don't have pro problems and struggles at home. And we didn't used to talk about that. Mm -hmm. You know, I would never think my preacher was anything less than perfect. Today, I know that's not true. Mm -hmm. But honestly, the millennials don't want to hear how great life mm -hmm. is. No. They want to hear the truth. Yeah, mm -hmm. They want to hear that when you fall, how do you get back up? Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've exactly. fallen. And that, you know, that old... Yeah, I've fallen, I can't, can't get, get back up. <laughs> yes. no, they, want to, they want you to tell them, yes, I've fallen before. Yes. I'm not perfect. Right. And I may fall tomorrow, right. but let me tell you about the God that helps me get back up. Yes. Mm -hmm. How that word applies to my life. And right. I can get back up. Right. And I can continue on. Mm -hmm. They want to see that. Mm -hmm. So you can't bake it with them. Right. No. Right. And how, how will our liturgy change mm -hmm. 
to accommodate, and I know there's this big debate, um, you know, do we have the smoke machines, do we have the lights, and yes. all that, and our millennials are looking for that, etc. I think that if we fuse the hymns with right. the new worship songs, yes. um, with yes. the hill song and the elevation music mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and some coritos in Spanish. I think it's a beautiful fusion yes. of who God is. Right. Um, and that will attract millennials. Yes. Yeah. The new church that I've been attending a little bit is very much that, right? And it's um, and nobody would wear a dress, you know, really to church there. Um, and it's just so different. And even this past Sunday, my kids, um, my daughter had to um, do some tutoring. So um, they said, can we just watch it at home? I mean, that in the old days, it, that would never fly, no. you know, from how I grew up. But but now it does, mm -hmm. you know, it works. Thank, thank goodness for yeah. TV 45. Right. We watched Real, real, um, real Talk mm -hmm. and it was great. So... Um, um, it is different, and I think we have to all recognize that. But back to kind of the body of Christ, um, we have to be so careful for those that do not know the Lord at all, um, the, the Pharisaical. I just still see yeah. so yes. much um, of, of the people that think that they know the Lord so much and they um, act so haughtier, and I just mm -hmm. think um, we just have to be so careful of that. Yeah. I, I myself have to be careful. Be careful about. to not just do church, but be the church. Because yes. 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 we, if we grew up in the church, we're real good at doing church. Mm -hmm. We know what to do. We know when to stand, when to sit, when to take communion, all of that. But, but it's to be the church and actually from Monday to Saturday. Right look like Jesus out there in the community, look look like what we're teaching on Sunday. That's huge. I think that's, our lives preach a better message than what we can hear on a Sunday. And that's, that is what I think is being the church yeah. is, you know, do your kids see the same person at the dinner table as they see on the stage? Is mm -hmm. that, you know, or do they see a hypocrite? Cause that's who right. Jesus was annoyed with, the hypocrites. Right, exactly. And right, I don't exactly. want to be that. I want to be the same here as I am there. The world is watching. The world is watching. watching. watching what we do, what we say, what we don't do, what we don't say. Yes. So, um, and you got to make sure also that the spirit of, of compromise doesn't yeah, creep into yes. your church because right. we're sometimes we're so concerned about growth and the numbers. numbers yes. And see, that's how David got in trouble. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He turned his trust from the God that had saved them from the bear and all the other things, the lion, and he turned his trust toward numbering his fighting men. Mm -hmm. So God was like, that's not, David, I was there before they were there. Mm -hmm. I took care of you even before then. So we got to not look at the number of people, mm -hmm. but look at the quality and the realness of the word that we're teaching. And stop compromising. That's one of the things we, we teach the word. We stand flat-footed and we teach the word of God who anybody can come. You can come as you are, dressed as you are. It's not about what you get, how you come. My concern is, do you remain the same after yes, you came? Right. Yes. That's yes. my concern. Yes. I'm not concerned about how you dressed when you right. came. The word is supposed right. to change you. Transform. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you're not supposed to conform. We're supposed to be transforming Transform. people. Mm -hmm. And that's what the word does. You just keep teaching mm -hmm. the word. And the mm -hmm. millennials, they're looking for those people. They're looking for the true word of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can't sure. compromise the word. One day you say one thing, and the next day you're saying something else. Well, here's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when we are preaching the word, the word is being preached to us, we're coming, we're listening, um, sometimes we go away and think, and I know you've heard this before, I know our viewers have heard this before, wow, that preacher was so political today. Why does he have to get political? Why can't he just preach the word? Why can't he just preach the word? The challenge is being able to see this distinction, which really there are plenty of social issues that are 100% biblical. Mm -hmm. Just because it's a social issue and it looks political. Most social issues, it's in the Bible. It's There's in the Bible. Issues. We're talking about we're poverty. Humans. These right. are poverty. Humans. Is that social or is that biblical? Biblical. We're talking about racism. Is that social or is that political? We're, I mean, social or is that or biblical? Are we talking about, um, well, here's a hard one, human rights. Right. Human rights. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that a political issue or is that a biblical issue? Mm -hmm. They're all biblical issues. Yes, they are. Anything right. that we're living, any challenges in our lives. So I can't stand it when I right. leave church and I hear somebody say, oh, that preacher was so political today. Uh-uh. Not unless they're telling you how to vote. Right. And right. they're not doing yeah. that right. because they're not right. even allowed yeah. to do that. Right. Right? right? You know what's so funny about that? We think things are new. <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. We're just repeating yeah. what we're saying. Yes. There's nothing mm -hmm. new under the sun. Mm -hmm. 
everything that's coming back up is coming back. It maybe seem like it's more, yeah. but it's not new. Nothing's new. Mm -hmm. So Never. we should be addressing it the way the Bible addressed it. I think about your church. Are you still, do you still have the Berean Bible study? Is that still the name of your Bible study? It's not. We, um, I remembered that. And, yes. and I love that about the church in Berea. That right. was what Paul encouraged, yeah, so. encouraged yeah, the right. church in Berea to don't trust what I'm saying. Go back right. to the word. Yes. Go back right. to and the that's words. so important. That's so important because pastors, you know, and our pastor said this, this week, it was so good. He said, my granddaddy taught me don't ever use the pulpit as a machine gun. Mm -hmm. Don't get up there and just mm -hmm. say what you think from that pulpit mm -hmm. unless it's the word of God. And yep. that's so important. And um, because we do need to do that. That's why we need to know the word. To, that sustains the weary. Mm -hmm. That's why the word has to get planted in our hearts so Amen. we can recognize because in the last days there's going to be false teachings. Yes. There's going to be things that are not lining up with the word of God. So unless we have educated ourselves and truly renewed our minds in the word of God like mm -hmm. we're supposed to do every day, yes. every day, then we're at risk of false teachers teaching us things that are not lined up with God's word. So we have to be like the Bereans. We right. have to go back to God's word and just see if it lines up with what we just learned. And that's huge right now, I think, for the church. Mm -hmm. The millennials want to know if it's real? Go back to the Word. Study your Word. Yeah, You'll know exactly. if it's real. Right. That's exactly. what I think. Right. Mm. Speaking of what's in the Bible, what does the Bible have to say about the relevance of the church today? What's wrong or what's right with the church? What does the Bible say? I have in the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, it says, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. Mm -hmm. For we were all baptized, one spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, mm -hmm. we were all given the one spirit to drink. Mm -hmm. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Mm. What if we lived like that, Jeanette? Oh. What if the body of Christ really did look like that? I love how you all kept pointing the way back to the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? The Word of God wants us to be unified. He yes. wants us to continue to thrive. He is the head. Yes. He said, we're not, the church is not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. They will know we are Christians by our love. By our love. Yes. By our absolutely, love. absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, ladies, so much oh, for being here with us that. today. Wonderful sharing. Great to see everybody. Great to have you all with us as as always ladies and gentlemen and and young moms and grandmoms and granddads and and even some young dads believe it or not when I get out in public there are a lot of guys that'll come up to me and say thank you for shh, don't tell anybody but I watch the current women the ladies are so good and they really help me understand my wives better so you guys who are watching today we love you we thank you for being part of us um, we thank God for the church there is some there are some things that are wrong with the church there's a lot right about what the church is doing the main thing is that Jesus is the head and the church is going to continue to thrive and to grow and to be all that it can be. So go back to the Word of God. Know that the church is in good shape and will continue to be. We're loving that you're part of our program today. Stay with us, though, because we've got more coming up. Coming up next. We, we, have, we have a major task as a church to continue to be the church. There will be a lot of forces coming from everywhere to make us something that we are not. We are the church. You're watching Barbara Beck on Welcome Home, where we share life-changing stories filled with hope.
You're watching Welcome Home, bringing you life-changing stories filled with hope. Hi everyone, I'm Barbara Beck and recently I had the pleasure to sit down with Pastors Gabriel Salguero, Dr. Nino Gonzalez and Dr. Richard Stearns at Calvario City Church. We had a long and powerful discussion on the topic of what's wrong with today's church, what can be done to help, and what does the future of the church hold? You won't want to miss this insightful conversation, so sit back relax and enjoy. So what do you all think is the greatest hope for the Hispanic Evangelical Church when we are talking about is the church dying away? Is the church, what's the greatest need? What's next for the church? What about the uh, Hispanic Evangelical Church? And let's even talk about the word evangelical because that's gotten almost to be a dirty word here of late. I, I like evangelical. It's a great word. I, I'm, I'm not going to let it go. It's from the word euangelion, which is good news. I like it. It means proclaimer of good news. Look, I, I, it sounds cliche-ish, but it's true. My grandmother used to sing, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. All other, all other ground is sinking sand. And so I'm not concerned uh, that there won't be a future for the church because as long as Christ lives, his church will live. But I think there are things we have to be aware of. Uh, one of our panelists in earlier in, in the, in the uh, summit that we had here talked about secularization, yes. about abandoning the faith, about, about indifference and an apathy. So I think the, the, the biggest challenge and place of promise is discipleship, mentoring, emerging generations of women and men, church planting mission, and this issue of what I, I don't even call it social justice. I call it biblical justice. I call it gospel justice. Yes. That if we're able to integrate that, the kind of justice, the discipleship of new generations, church planting and missions, there will always be a, 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 a generation of women and men hungry for that, that integrated gospel. But it might not always look like it looks today. Would you agree with that? I mean, you have a beautiful facility here. We are, by the way, at Calvario City Church, and you, you preach to thousands of people weekly, but that doesn't have to look like the church. I mean, it'll, it's always going to be a challenge. You know, the challenge of the church, it's always going to be there regardless of if it's Latino. You know, I'm thinking, going historically, every ethnic that came to America had his own challenges in those particular times. And pretty much they lived some of the things that we're living even today. Uh, but I feel that we need to continue uh, learning of, of history, learning from our past, learning from our uh, past uh, leaders and uh, and hoping for the future. I mean, you know, we. I feel that uh, these are great moments. I mean, you know, I look at America and I know what's happening right now, but I'm saying, yes, this is the time for the church to rise and, and be the church, regardless of whatever, you know, the, the trends out there. We're going to continue. We're going to continue. I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm excited to, to, to pastor here in Orlando, uh, Calvario City Church. You know, I, I said at our luncheon that uh, I often say to church leaders, Jesus called us to lead a revolution, not to build an institution. And uh, the, the challenge of Christ to his followers was to literally go into the world and take it by storm, to, to take captive every thought, to challenge every institution, uh, to go into the world's brokenness uh, with healing power, uh, spiritual healing power, social healing power. And so when we look at the brokenness of our world, we look at homelessness, we look at broken families, we look at the opioid addiction, we look at refugees, we look at immigration and violence in Latin America. Um, these are the broken things in our world and the church is called into the brokenness. I, I have a bi biology degree and I, I, I know a little bit about uh, our white blood cells. And one of the wonderful metaphors for me is that the church of Jesus Christ is like, uh, we should be like the white blood cells of the world. White blood cells, if you get a cut or a wound or an infection, the white blood cells rush to the site of the infection or the wound to close the wound, to heal it, to fight off the, the bacteria. Um, and they, they're designed to go into the broken parts of your body to heal it. And what a wonderful metaphor for the church that wherever there's a wound uh, in humanity, wherever there's brokenness, the church rushes in to heal, to close the wound, to, to uh, redeem the situation. And when the church does that, most of that happens outside the walls of the four church, you know, uh, four walls of the church. Some of it happens within the church because broken people come into the church as well. Um, but this church is not 
contained in this building. Right now, we're on a weekday at this church. This church is in the marketplace in Orlando. This church is in the school systems in Orlando. This church is in the local government of Orlando. This church is at home raising children uh, to be followers of Jesus Christ. So the church is out of the salt shaker, if you will, and uh, being salt and light in the community and in the world. Yeah, I, I think that what, what uh, Nino and, and Rich are saying is so important. We, every generation has its challenges, and the church has to struggle to contextualize and, and reinvent itself. But if we stay core to the mission of loving Jesus and loving people and going to the broken places and being what Henry Nouwen called wounded healers and, and, and healing people, I think that is the appeal. You know, the early Christians were known for when people were abandoning leper colonies, they were rushing in. When people were abandoning places that had urban decay, they were rushing in. And so let's, uh, the theologian John in scripture says, we need to do our first works over again. What are those first works? It's to love people in their brokenness, in, in, their, in their virtue, in their beauty, and in their brokenness. And, I, and as long as we stay uh, true to that call of Christ on our lives, I think there's a, a, a brilliant future. Where people see crisis, I think Pastor Nino is right. I, I see opportunity, and I see revival. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that even anymore, but there's real revival in what God is able to do in us, through us, and, and despite us. Let's talk just for a minute about what you have actually seen in Puerto Rico. I, I mean, I hear different kinds of reports that, believe it or not, just the other day, somebody said to me, they don't really want our help. Puerto Rico doesn't need it or want it. They want to sustain themselves. I mean, I had just talked to you, Gabriel, and I heard what you had said going to Puerto Rico and how much they embrace our help and need our help. And Rich, you know that as well. You, were, you spent nine months down there, World Vision. So um, what is the climate like? From the beginning, I feel that, uh, you know, we were all connected somehow with what was happening in Puerto Rico. And it, I mean, I think Pastor Gabriel, uh, days after the hurricane was already in Puerto Rico, a lot of the governmental agencies were in Puerto Rico immediately, church agency, church ministries, all of them, and distributed, not only in the northern part, but even in like, you know, World Vision in the middle, in the center, and other, and in other areas. We, we received so much help from all agencies that we are so, so grateful. So whoever said that we, we're not welcome or uh, United States is not welcome, I think uh, is listening to some other, uh, uh, some other stations or whatever. But I feel that we're so grateful for what happened in the last few months in Puerto Rico and the help that we received. And uh, not only from uh, you know, the federal agency, the locals, other countries came in, other countries came in, other denominations, all denominations from Latin America somehow were represented in Puerto Rico. So, I, I mean, and, and, it's, and it's still going. It's, it's still continuing. Like we heard um, Pastor Ivan says that uh, the metropolitan area are okay right now, but some, some parts of the country, some towns in the country, they're still needing uh, some help, but uh, it's there. Yeah, I, I think that what I saw is, is, and what I see most recently, I went... Uh, uh, some time ago, is people saying, we want partnerships. Uh, what I love about the World Vision model, and there are other, many other organizations that were there, just to name a few, Convoy of Hope, Samaritan's Purse, a, a whole host of other organizations, in a, including kind of uh, government agencies. What they said is, hey, partner with us. Right? But we, people forget that before, we, before Irma and Maria, Puerto Rico was already suffering a catastrophe, an economic catastrophe. So what this did was exacerbate an already very tenuous and delicate situation. And so what I love and what I respect is that we're working with people on the ground, that the leadership is not Calvario City Church in Orlando or, or World Vision from Seattle, that the leadership is pastors from Utuado or Ponce or Orocovis or, 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 or Arecibo or, or Guayama. The pastors are the leaders, and what we're saying is, tell us what to do. We come alongside you. And so that's, that's the level of partnership that I think is welcome. Vis-a-vis, -vis, we're gonna, we're the messianic kind of complex, we're here to save you, no. But when you say, you know this island better than we do, this is your home, you tell us what to do and we'll just wanna come alongside you. That's the model that people appreciate because it, it gives people dignity while it cooperates with what God is doing in and through them. Let me, let me say this, just to put this in context, Puerto Rico is an island 100 miles long by 35 miles wide. In that 
territory, there are over 6,000, almost 7,000 churches, evangelical churches. It's one of the most populated church uh, islands or territories. So I heard the governor at one point say, say, it had not been for the church. I mean, a lot of churches suffer, but there were still thousands of churches standing. And they were pretty much the first responders were the church already in the ground, do, do helping out volunteers, rushing out. So if they had waited for, you know, all the uh, bureaucracy and all, nothing would have happened. The church was one of the first one to be already in some of those places. So, I, I, you know, we, we praise God for the, for the church. It's a, it's, the church is a powerful volunteer army. And we have infrastructure and we have relationships. It's, you know, um, the governor came here to Central Florida to thank uh, the evangelical church in Central Florida. He also went to New York and, and some other uh, states. Thing. And he says, what helped us was that those relationships existed before the crisis. We, churches across the country, and, and so we need to develop relationships in Korea and South Korea. So before crises happen, so if and when a crisis happens, the church is ready to respond in an instance. And I think that's the model of kind of relational capital that, that helps the infrastructure flow much more quickly uh, and much more seamlessly in a way that empowers indigenous groups. So to me, here's the challenge. I hear what you're saying. Um, there'll be people out there listening today that are like, well, I'm invested, I pray, I give to my church. How do you get that fire that you go, I mean, there are verses in the Bible that talk, and one of my favorite that I've just learned in the last few um, months, I don't know it by heart, but it talks about standing up for those who have no voice, for the marginalized, for the vulnerable, for the, for the underdog, obviously I'm paraphrasing, but the Bible tells us this, right? That's from Proverbs 31, the Bible tells us to stand up and give those people a voice who have no voice. So how do we catch the fire? It's obviously obvious that you three gentlemen have that fire. How do we get that into each one of the viewers hearts today that says, yeah, there is relational capital. I do need to know more about what's going on in, in countries around the world that are struggling. And it's not just the Latinos, it's Syria, it's in the Middle East, it's everywhere. How do I stop just caring about my next door literal neighbor yeah i think one of the real things we have to fight in our society or in any society is we get very insular you know it's all about us our family our community our church and that's our worldview right uh, it's not a world vision it's kind of a small vision and um you know as i preach in different churches around the country or speak to pastors my wife always tells me tell more stories tell more stories people don't want to hear your statistics they want to hear the stories of real children, real mothers, real fathers. And she's over 20 years, I've learned she's right, because uh, what we need, we're humans, and we need a human connection. The reason child sponsorship has worked for 65 years for World Vision is uh, it allowed us to say to a Christian in the middle of Kansas, right, um, you can't solve global poverty, but would you be willing to help one little boy or one little girl. Her name is Maria, his name is Jose. Mm -hmm. uh, he's five years old, he's lost his father, he lives in this community in Guatemala, uh, and he's hungry. And, uh, and sponsorship is like magic because people say, I'd help one little boy, I'd help one little girl, I, maybe I could help two or three, uh, because we've humanized it. These are human beings that they're just like us. They're, they're, they're made in God's image. They have the same hopes and dreams, the same fears, uh, and many of them have greater challenges than we have in terms of the situation they were born into. And so uh, our founder, Bob Pierce, uh, had this famous little prayer. He said, let my heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. And what he was saying to people is God's heart is broken when a child goes to bed hungry, when a child is exploited in child labor or trafficking. God's heart is broken when a family loses everything as a refugee because of a missile strike and they have to flee from their home and flee from their country and leave their business behind, God's heart is broken. And he wants our hearts to be broken by those same things. But, you know, our hearts don't like to be broken. Uh, and so we have to actually make space in our heart uh, for people often who are not like us. They don't speak our language. They don't look like us racially or ethnically. Um, they might not even be of our faith. But we have to make room in our hearts to say, this little girl in the middle of Syria deserves my compassion. And uh, maybe I can pray for them. Maybe I can give to make their life a little more bearable during this difficult time. But 
the biggest challenge we face, frankly, is helping good-minded Christians to feel that pain, that heartbreak, uh, over the children of the world uh, who God cries for and weeps for. And, and so that message, I think pastors have to be lead, uh, take leadership in that. Pastors have to remind their congregations of their responsibilities around the world uh, and in our own community. And, you, you know, we love to take pastors to see the work. Uh, Short-term missions is a great tool. Take members of your congregation to actually see what poverty looks like. S look into the eyes of a child that's hungry, and you'll never forget it. You'll come back and you'll say, I'm going to give more. I'm going to serve more. I'm going to do more because now I know his name. Now I've seen him. I've met his mother. I've seen his mother cry because she can't feed her little boy. Well, and integrating, you're making me think of, of integrating relationships for me to go to an African-American church, which we hate to even say that because they shouldn't be African-American churches and white churches and Latino churches and Asian churches. How do we get rid of that kind of segregation? Just rich on a, a real local level, you know, let's just talk about that rather than, you know, taking a missions trip to Syria, but, but just how do we do it here locally for the viewer today to say, I need to get to know somebody who's Latino. I'm so glad personally that I got to know Gabriel and his wife, Jeanette. They are, they have enriched my life greatly. Um, but, but we need to make that effort and to be intentional about it. So give us some tangible, practical tools on how to make that happen. Look, I, th I think the gospel is a boundary, boundary breaking gospel. It's, it's, a, it's a boundary crossing gospel. And uh, you asked the question earlier about, you know, how do you get that fire? Yeah. Well, well, gratitude is the fire because you've been reached by grace, because God touched you, because God had mercy on you. I, I was born in a very poor home, and I had a uh, government assistant and hand-me-down clothes, and, and I was hearing Rich's story uh, and, and some of the challenges he's, and you should hear Pastor Nino's story from, from the Bronx. He's a, he's, he, he talks about Puerto Rico, but he was born in the Bronx, suburb of Puerto Rico. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and I think, you know, I went to Malawi, and my wife was a missionary in Ghana. She lived in Ghana for a while, Jeanette. And I went to a, a clinic where there was a severely undernourished little girl. Her name is Julia. And her father had slept with her there all night, and they were trying to nourish her. She suffered from stunting and all kinds of things. And I asked the nurse to translate for me. I said, and he said to me, the nurse said to me, I asked, what's her father's name? And he said, Hector. I'll never forget Julie again because Hector's my father's name. Mm. And so, um, yeah, and so if you identify with Julia in Malawi, why can't you identify with Julia on Orange Blossom Trail right. or on John Young right. Parkway or across the street or, or in Bronx or Brooklyn or, or Queens or, or, or Winter Park, whatever, or Vito Tuado? This is important that the kind of, that she's my sister. She, the, I saw in her father my father. And I saw in her story, my story. And it's the famous um, narrative where there's a little boy throwing starfish yeah. back, into the, back into the ocean. And there are thousands of them, thousands of them. And an older kid comes up, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, says to the kid, you know you're never going to throw all, that, all those starfish back into the ocean. You're not making a difference. He takes a starfish and he throws it back and he says, made a difference to that one. That's right. Made a difference to that one. So you got to make a difference wherever you can. Um, you were talking about, Rich, how people love stories. I'd love to hear your story. What did create that fire in you? You were a very successful businessman, CEO of Parker Brothers, of Linux Fine China, and, and all of a sudden God called you to go away from that. You were already a Christian, right, when you were, you were a CEO of those businesses. Okay, so, so what caused you to, to give it all up? I'm going to tell you a funny little story. So I became a Christian at age 24 at the Wharton School of Business. I may be the only person that's ever given their life to the Lord at the Wharton School of Business uh, because they worship a different God there, yeah. uh, Mammon. And, uh, but I, the commitment I made to the Lord that night was, you know, I want to live my life for you. I will go where you call me to go. I'll do what you call me to do. And uh, shortly after I became a believer, I got engaged to the young woman who uh, had been very instrumental in leading me to the faith, my wife Renee. And she said, honey, we need to go out and register for our fine china in Crystal. We need to do a bridal registry. 
now they register for yoga lessons and That's Fitbits, right. but, uh, <laughs> but in those days it was China and crystal and silver. And, and I got very self-righteous and I said, you know, I'm a brand new Christian. I said, as long as there are children starving in the world, we are not going to have fine China, crystal and silver. It's too opulent. It's too indulgent. That money could be used to help the poor, you know? And uh, so very meekly, she was like, oh, you know, and she missed her one chance to register. We didn't register. We got a lot of dumb wedding gifts that we didn't need. And, um, but ironically, 25 years later, I was the CEO of the largest China crystal and silver company in America, Lenox, um, makes the China for the White House. And uh, so uh, one day in my CEO office, an executive recruiter called and said he was representing World Vision. They're looking for a new president. And it's a long story that I'll shorten, but I heard God's voice in my ear on that phone call saying, do you remember that young man when he was 24, who was so passionate about helping hungry children that he would not even register, allow his bride to register for China Crystal and Silver. Look at who you've become. Look in the mirror. If that young man is still somewhere inside of you, I have a job that needs to be done, and I'd like you to do it. And that ultimately is kind of the bookends of my story that um, God took that fire from my 20s, um, and he brought it back in my 40s and said, now you've got the training, now you've got the experience, now you've got the leadership background, I need you to lead something important. And so, and you know, the other part of that story is my wife and I met on a blind date, and uh, I said to her, what do you wanna be when you graduate from Cornell University? We were both there, and she said, oh, I'm gonna help the poor. God has called me to help the poor. And I said, well, that's very sweet and noble. And she said, what about you? What are you going to want to do? And I was not a believer then. I said, I'm going to become a CEO and make a lot of money. And she said, that's pathetic. She said, what a terrible life goal just to make money. Don't you want to do something more meaningful? That's when our romance started and, uh, you know, opposites attract. And, uh, and of course, now all those years later, I think it's 45 years since our blind date, but I'm helping the poor, and my wife is right beside me uh, because she was my inspiration uh, to do that, her consistency. So Amazing, amazing story. Nino, I know you've got one. Well, my story is that uh, I saw the, you know, I'm, I'm the result of a home that was not the, the, the right home, the right home. Uh, I come from a, a father who had three wives. I'm the, I'm the product of my, of my, my father's third wife. Uh, sometimes I say, God has some sense of humor. You know, I should have come from an orderly home or, or a, you know, the right home. But he, my father was a World War II veteran, goes to New York, 1946, lives a wild life, broken, rebellious, bad attitude, abusive, and... Um, and my mother is the one that gives her heart to Jesus. And that's when the miracle begins. And I was already six years old. And I saw my father come to God. And we saw immediately. I mean, it stopped. It gave him order. It gave him a sense of order. So, and then all of a sudden, God calls him to the ministry. And he becomes a pastor. And he didn't qualify, you know, with, with denominational standards. But God gave him a church in Puerto Rico. And uh, so, Barbara, I, the reason why I keep the message going is because I saw the power of God in a home that was broken. And it brought healing. It brought order. It, it, we were raised in a Christian home. I saw my father ma uh, be made a prayer warrior. Uh, 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 my mother was a, uh, she was a compassionate. My mother would give, she would even give our clothes. <laughs> She would give everything out. And, uh, and that was, I, I was raised there. So now I'm a pastor and I said, man, I saw the power of God real in the life of people. There is, there is power in the gospel. I have to, I have to continue to share the story. And, uh, and so that's what we do here in Calvario. You know, share the story that power of Jesus can change somebody's life and it can change a future and a generation. You know, it's amazing to hear your story because my father had three wives and I was the product of his third oh wife. 
But we didn't have the same redemptive story, alcoholism and all of that, and it wasn't until I met my future wife that I was really introduced to the gospel, but it sounds like we came from kind of a similar situation, alcoholism, you know, bankruptcy, foreclosure, all of this, and uh, uh, God can work with all of us, right? Uh, nobody's a lost cause. You know, there's so many things that I could say and so much that I've gotten out of our time together. But I guess one of the greatest things is that there's hope in Jesus Christ alone. And if we can just get that message to every person who is listening today, there's hope for the church. There's hope for those in Syria, for the refugees, for the immigrants, for the, for the drug addict, for the felon. There's hope for everybody. Dr. Nino Gonzalez, thank you so much for leading this great church, Calvario City Church, and for being on our panel today. Dr. Richard Stearns for writing your great book and for all that you've done for world vision throughout the years. Thank you. And may God continue to richly bless you as you move on to another chapter in your life here soon. And of course, Dr. Gabriel Salguero, love you dearly, brother, as I love all three of you and all the work that you're doing in Nalick and just making sure that the Latino Evangelical Coalition and the church continues to thrive and to grow. And it will. As long as viewers, we and our hearts, our prayer for you today is for your heart to be broken as God's heart is broken. And then we serve. And then we give that cup of water to someone. And we spread the gospel to everyone who's listening and everybody who's available out there. Stand up for the destitute, for those who are in need, for the vulnerable. And I'm just so grateful for our time together. We're out of time for now, but we've got a little bit more coming up. So stay with us. We'll be right back. You're watching Barbara Beck on Welcome Home, where we share life-changing stories of hope. Amazing conversation, right? We'd like to thank pastors Gabriel Salguero, Dr. Nino Gonzalez, and Dr. Richard Stearns, and the crew at Calvario City Church that provided the filming of this panel. So much good food for thought about where the church is heading. Bottom line, we're in a good place because Christ is head of the church. Stay with us. We have more coming up. Moments with Mo. The church is God's plan for redemption of the world. For those of us who call Jesus Lord, we are the church. We're his bride. But the truth is, sometimes I think the bride of Christ can get a little off and we can find ourselves looking a little different than God's vision and a little more like Bridezilla. I think we do this when we forget what the church is supposed to be. Oh friends, God's perfect plan for the church was laid out in the second chapter of Acts, verses 42 through 47. The word says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What a beautiful depiction of the church. The Acts Church did life together. They ate together and they carried each other's burdens. They sold possessions to share with others. They were worshipers, faithful students, and they were givers. Givers of their time and givers of their resources. Guess what? Healthy churches are still doing these things today. 
healthy churches are still serving, caring, fellowshipping, and studying. I promise you there's still churches out there that are concerned about saving souls and fulfilling the Great Commission to go into the world and preach the gospel. There are healthy churches today that are still following the Acts 2 church model. They believe in God's saving, restoring, miracle-working power made available to us in and through the Holy Spirit. Oh, friends, don't lose faith in the church. It's God's plan. Jesus died for the church. He loves the church. We are the church. If sometimes we get a little off, thank God for the roadmap of God's word to steer us back. Thank God for the Acts 2 definition of the church. May we follow their example and shine like the beautiful bride of Christ, clothed in majesty, wearing robes of righteousness, watching and preparing for our bridegroom Jesus to return. For more on renewing your mind in the Word of God, visit us at Unforsaken Women or check out our website, unforsakenwomen.com. got a lot out of our program today. There's often a lot of negative discussion going on about the church. Yes, the church has her fair share of problems, but this is important to remember. Christ is the head of the church, and because of that simple truth, the church will survive, thrive, and continue to deeply and profoundly impact the world and each one of us personally. I grew up going to a Methodist church. We hardly ever missed and to this day, my 95-year-old mother wants to get to church, even though it's always a challenge for her physically. And once she's there, she really can't hear a thing, even with a hearing aid. So why go? Why the church? Well, when I was a little girl in Sunday school, I have a strong memory of our teacher asking us why we went to church. Many kids said, because their parents made them go. I don't remember anyone having any kind of really profoundly spiritual reason for going. I do remember not sharing my answer, which would have been because it's a habit. You know, that's not a bad reason for going. It's obviously not the right answer, but it kind of worked for me. I wanted my children to go to church to learn about Jesus, to become more like Him, and to understand worship with other believers. And that happened. My grown daughters today love the Lord, they have godly husbands, and they love to go to church. Maybe we don't always stop and think, why go to church? Rather, we just do it because it's the right thing to do. But let's be sure our children and grandchildren really know why church is important. Let's have those critical discussions around the dinner table, and let's identify why church and not just because we said so. And that, dear friends, is our note of hope for today. Thanks so much for joining us, and God bless you. You just watched Welcome Home with Barbara Beck, a Good Life 45 original production. That makes you a part of our hope team here on Good Life 45, where hope happens.